Good morning. Uh, welcome to this uh, PCI Express storage webinar. Uh, my name is Gordon Getty. I'm an application engineer for Teledyne LaCroix Protocol Solutions Group in Santa Clara, California. We put this webinar together today to uh, talk a little bit about the, the change in trend in, in PCI and storage technologies moving towards uh, PCI Express based uh, technology rather than the conventional uh, SATA and SAS storage. Uh, and this is mainly brought about by the, the advent of solid state drives. So I'm going to talk a little bit of background about PCI Express. Let me just get this onto the next page here. So this is the agenda, what I'm going to cover today. We're going to talk a little bit about the, the layered model that PCI Express is based on. Uh, why we use PCI Express for storage technologies, the advantages that PCI Express has over existing technologies. I'll talk a little bit about the hardware form factors. So we're seeing different uh, form factors for PCI Express based uh, uh, solid state drives uh, compared to what we had in the past with SAS and SATA drives. Uh, also, it's different form factors for PCI Express devices that, that are starting to emerge. And then I'll talk a little bit about PCI Express storage technology. Uh, we'll do some in-depth uh, analysis of, of PCI Express based storage trace that uses NVMe. I also have an example of what uh, serial ATA or SATA Express over HCI looks like on uh, PCI Express trace. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the PCI Express layered model. So PCI Express was built on this model, uh, which allowed it to really uh, developed from the conventional PCI and PCI-X model. Um, the upper layers of the model were really taken over from the PCI and PCI-X uh, model, which allowed software to really remain the same or very similar in the way software manages the, the I.O. for the system. The main differences are, are really around the physical layer, but the way a device is configured is, is very similar, whether it's a PCI uh, device from 20 years ago compared to a PCI Express Gen 3 device of today. So if we look at this model, there's uh, starting at the bottom, uh, the physical layer comprises of two blocks. There's the electrical sub-block where the analog signaling is defined. That is where you would use an oscilloscope, you would see what the actual signal looks like. Uh, that part is part that really changed significantly between uh, Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3 PCI Express. I'll talk a, a little bit more about that later. Um, but also this part is is where it's completely different from, from PCI. The, the changeover from PCI to PCI Express was from a parallel bus to a serial link. Uh, but when they moved to this layered model in PCI Express, uh, extracting the physical layer out allows them to change the the bandwidth and the electrical signaling on the link without changing the upper layers in the, in the stack. Uh, I'll talk a little bit also in a moment about MFI, so you can have PCI Express even over an MFI physical link, which takes the same software stack but has a different physical layer. I'll have an example of that in a moment. Also built into the physical layer, but not on the electrical level, is the logical sub-block of the physical layer. That logical sub-block is where things like link training take place. This is where two devices try to talk to each other and establish a link between themselves to be able to transfer data ultimately. But this is where basically each side of the link will send out patterns, which lets the other side of the link recognize uh, that it's trying to train, and then they negotiate certain features about the low-level link uh, to eventually bring the link to the L0 state in which case it can then establish the data transfer of the data link layer and above. I'll show some examples in a little while of that. So if I was to take an analyzer trace and, and look at what would I see at each of these layers in the PCI Express stack, at the very bottom layer we have eye diagrams. That's where we're using the oscilloscope to measure the analog signal characteristics. Uh, everything above the electrical sub-block, we would use a protocol analyzer to look at. So the logical sub-block, you're going to see TS1s, training sequences, TS2s, and all ordered sets. Ordered sets are really just patterns that are on the link that allow a receiver to be able to identify what the other side is sending to it. Um, this became significantly more complex in Gen 3, so PCI Express 3.0, where there was uh, dynamic equalization introduced. This is where there's a protocol at the logical physical layer which actually adjusts the analog signal characteristics in the electrical layer. 
So this made it somewhat more complex, uh, but again, the upper layers stayed very similar. So the kind of things I would see at the data link layer, the data link layer is where the management of packets across a link happens. So that's where we have data link layer packets, including init FC. That's where the initialization of the flow control credits for each side of the link. Update flow control, so that's where for posted, non-posted and completion credits are updated as the link uh, is passing data back and forth. The ACK and NAC protocol is at the data link layer. That's where we can manage the a packet is the integrity of the packet is checked when it gets to the other side of the link. It doesn't care about what data is actually inside the packet, but it checks that the packet was there correctly and the CRC check was done. Some other types of packets that we may see at the data link layer are uh, DLLPs such as PM enter L1, so power management entry packets. Those are where the link is, uh, or the data link layer is directing the, the physical layer to go to a low power state. And that's something that's been certainly becoming more prevalent recently with the power savings on, on systems. So the power management on the on the PCI Express link can enable significant power savings for, for the, the link when it's basically not doing anything. The transaction layer is the next layer up. Uh, this is where we're going to see TLPs or transaction layer packets. There's three or uh, four main groups of those. The first ones you'll see are, are configuration read and write. This is where the enumeration of a PCI Express device is done. The configuration space, which is defined for a PCI Express device, is uh, compatible with the conventional PCI configuration space. So if we looked at that on a system of 10 or 15 years ago, that configuration space basically looks the same. They made the use of pointers from that to allow extended capabilities to be used for for uh, the PCI Express capabilities. Um, so they are taken from the, the basic config space through pointers. Um, we have software tools that we can read that, and I'll show you an example in a moment of a, a software tool that allows you to, to go look at the configuration space registers of the of the device. This becomes important also when we're talking about PCI Express storage, when a system has to identify which type of device is connected to the links. So one of the first things the BIOS and a system would do is take a look at what device this is from the class code, and I'll show an example of that later. We also have memory reads and writes. This is really where the data is transferred back and forth across the link. The memory read uh, is from, it can go in either direction. Uh, one thing I mentioned, uh, config reads will always go in the downstream direction, so they'll always come from the root to the endpoint. But memory reads and writes can go in either direction, and usually the device driver is what's going to determine which memory reads and writes go out on the link. I.O. reads and writes, we don't see so much of those nowadays, but it's just another form of, of I.O. Uh, data transfer at the transaction layer. And something that we do see uh, are messages. So interrupts can be written done as messages. Conventional interrupts or legacy interrupts uh, are done using messages. Uh, there's set slot power limit message which is sent out when the link establishes it first that determines how much power the device is going to use. Um, also errors can be communicated in messages, so whether it's a correctable error, an incorrectable error, a fatal or non-fatal error, those are, are done in message TLPs. Now when we go to the next layer up, this is where all the PCI Express storage uh, resides. So the commands, if it's an NVMe command or an Ethernet frame or an HCI command, those are all embedded within memory reads and writes at the, the transaction layer. The transaction layer really doesn't care what the data is inside those memory reads and writes. That's where the upper application layers will actually decode that. So if I look at the two ends of the link, the root complex or the host is uh, basically the PC, the motherboard, if you're, if you're talking about a PC application. Uh, that has its own protocol stack, and then there's the endpoint device at the other end. So there's an application somewhere, and the host is going to try to send some data to outside of that. If you think of the example of, of a disk drive or an Ethernet controller, the data goes from the software application on the host the device driver packages that, packages that all up to talk to the I.O. on the board. 
that's sent across the PCI Express link, then decoded, and whatever is done with it on the other side, is it depends on the application. But ultimately, that data ends up on the other side of the link, whether it goes out as an Ethernet packet or uh, data to a storage controller, the principle is the same. The PCI Express link is a full duplex link, so there's a TX and an RX on, on each side. Um, when you're talking about electrical testing, you're really talking about the TX and the RX of a particular device. So that would be either the root complex of the host or the endpoint. Uh, when we're talking about protocol and an analyzing the protocol, we're looking at the interaction between these two devices. So we're looking at what's happening on the PCI Express link. So when you're talking about a protocol analyzer, there's not a TX and an RX as such. It's really an upstream and a downstream. And we, we use the terminology downstream as from the host to the endpoint and upstream from the endpoint to the host. So the root complex of the host would be considered an upstream component and the endpoint would be considered a downstream component. So. I mentioned briefly earlier about uh, MPCIE. So what is uh, a, an MPCIE link? So this is really a PCI Express link which consists of an MPCIE, an MPHI physical layer. So the, the physical layer specification in this case is developed by the MIPI Alliance as opposed to the PCI SIG. But the PCI Express specification allows to have physical layers uh, which are not necessarily based on the PCI Express specification. So if I go back to the the layered model, if I look at the equivalent model with an MPHI link, it basically looks the same except for that bottom component there, which is MPHI rather than uh, rather than conventional PCI Express electrical signaling. So if I looked at a configuration space scan of an MPCIE device. It actually looks just the same as a, a normal PCI Express device. So as far as software is concerned, it doesn't really care what the physical layer is. So this is a, a tool I mentioned earlier, a Telescan software. It's a free tool that's available from our website for download. And that allows you to scan all the devices on a system, all the configuration space of the devices in a, in a system. This will work on a Windows or a Linux uh, platform. There's various versions of Linux that we support. Um, so you can go out there, you can read, and you can write also the registers on, on those devices. It's a good way to see what the capabilities of a device are and also the status of a device at, at quite a low level, really. This is at the PCI Express transaction layer. So when you're trying to debug this, it's very important to identify which layers the issues are happening at. And if I take this a stage further, so if you're talking about debugging a PCI Express storage protocol, such as NVMe or HCI, finding if the problem is a storage problem or a software problem or is it an electrical problem. So if it's related to power management, for example, it could be a very low layer problem. If it's related to errors on the link, it could be a signal integrity problem or it could be a software or a firmware problem. The key thing here is to make sure you identify which layer the issues are happening at. If you can do that, then it's going to make debugging the problem a lot easier. And sometimes it means you're going to have to go back to the lower levels of PCI Express and validate that they're actually working correctly before you try and do the storage part. There's errors that may be shown at the physical, they may be physical layer errors, but they may show in bad packets or errors being reported at the higher layers. So you'll often hear the terminology for PCI Express devices, Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3. So what, what, what's the difference? So really, Gen 1 refers to the PCI Express 1.0 specification. That would be the 1.0A or 1.1. Gen 2 refers to the PCI Express 2.0 specification, Gen 3, 3.0 specification. So a Gen 3 device, for example, doesn't necessarily support higher speeds than a Gen 2 device. but it may implement different ECNs that were incorporated after the 1.0 or 2.0 specs. So the changes go beyond just the speed capability. And uh, there's other ECNs. An example there is L1 substates. So that was an ECN that was introduced after the 2.0 specification. Actually, the 3.0 specification. And uh, that was something that a 2.0 device wouldn't know about necessarily. It doesn't have anything to do with the link going at 5 gig or 8 gig. 
It's just uh, something that was introduced in a later spec. So we, we tend to use Gen 1, Gen 2 and Gen 3 synonymously with 2.5 gig, 5 gig and 8 gig, although this is really not exactly correct to do this. So a PCI Express 1.0a or 1.1 device, it's allowed to support 2.5 gig, but it doesn't necessarily have to support 2.5 gig. A PCI Express 2.0 device must support 2.5 and can support 5 gig. So the there is not a requirement to support 5 gig. It must support 2.5 gig, though. So I actually make a correction. A PCI Express 1.0a or 1.1 device must support 2.5 gig. Actually, all devices must support 2.5 gig. That goes for PCI Express 1.0, 1.1, 2.0, 3.0. So when a link comes up initially, it will always come up at 2.5 gig. And then that's where in the training sequences, it's advertised what is the capability. Can it go to a higher speed? So you could, you could plug a PCI Express 3.0 card into a PCI Express 1.0 motherboard and it should still link up, albeit at 2.5 gig. So how does this apply to the layered model? So there's different components to it. The speed part is obviously at the, the lower layer, at the physical layer, but there's also changes in the configuration space, new capabilities that are added. Um, and uh, so it's not necessarily just the physical layer. This is, becomes important when you want to do compliance testing on the device because the compliance tests are different depending on the specifications. So a PCI Express 3.0 device that only supports 2.5 gig would be tested differently to a PCI Express 1.0 device that supports 2.5 gig. The test cases would be different. Um, and that's just what I mentioned on this slide here. The way the PCI SIG tests these devices is different. So talking about compliance testing, so the layered model is really what determines which tests are done. So at the electrical level, we have link e equalization and de-emphasis testing, transmitter signal quality, receiver jitter tolerance. There's also PLL loop bandwidth testing done at that level. And then as you move up through the stack, the link layer uh, from link training, there's equalization protocol, which is actually in the logical sub-block of the, of the physical layer. There's data link layer testing, transaction layer testing, and then the application layer is really at the BIOS level and the PCI Express configuration space, which is, is at the transaction layer slash application layer. So there's, there's compliance tests for each of these, and uh, uh, LaCroix is a, is a provider of, of tools for uh, almost all of these. PCI Express configuration testing is done with a software tool from, from the PCI SIG. When it comes to NVMe compliance testing, that's actually done with a different organization. So the University of New Hampshire, their interoperability lab, uh, has uh, been working with the NVMe promoters group and created a set of test collateral and tests, which, which also run on the, the same hardware as we use for PCI Express compliance testing for link layer. Because if we go back, this is really an application layer test uh, with it being uh, at the uh, the NVMe level, which is something embedded into the PCI Express transaction layer. The next uh, plug fest for the NVMe compliance is, is scheduled for, for November this year. So why do we use PCI Express for, for storage? So these are the existing technologies that were around. A hard disk drive, I'm sure everybody's familiar with that, is a mechanical disk drive, has moving parts, a spinning disk inside it. Uh, technologies. Uh, pretty old, uh, it's reliable, it's been around for a long time, but it, but it starts to hit physical bottlenecks. Uh, solid state drives are becoming a lot more popular now, so they're basically emulating one of those hard drives, and traditional SSDs that we have nowadays are really logically based on a SATA drive or a SAS drive, so although it's, it's not a PCI Express based SSD, it looks just like a, a normal SATA or SAS drive. So the next generation of drives take that a stage further and make that into a, a native PCI Express drive. Another type of drive which is, is really a, a, a hybrid of cost and performance. So the performance of SSDs is significantly higher and are more scalable than, than that of a, a conventional hard drive is uh, the hybrid hard drive. So they basically have a, a, a solid state drive cache 
with a spinning drive, a conventional drive behind it. So this gives a, a performance boost over a regular SATA drive, uh, but it also uh, allows to have a sizable amount of storage for, for a lower cost. So the solid state drive technology has been moving on in leaps and bounds over the last uh, couple of years. Um, at the PCI SIG workshops over the last two years, we've seen a significant number of uh, storage devices now on PCI Express cards. Uh, rather than uh, typically in the past, we see a lot of graphics cards, storage controllers, but we're now seeing more uh, in the way of uh, actual flash-based SSDs, which are on a PCI Express card. I'll talk about form factors in a moment, but this one here in particular is a, is a standard PCI Express uh, form factor, uh, but it's a, it's a drive uh, rather than a, an actual storage controller. These devices basically emulate a, a, a hard drive just like a, a conventional hard drive. Uh, as far as software is concerned, it still sees it as a normal hard drive. So when we talk about SSDs, the controller for the SSD is really on the drive. So the interface to it is coming from PCI Express. Whether it's a serial ATA drive and an SSD, it may go to uh, from PCI Express to a serial ATA adapter. And then that is then connected to a serial ATA drive. Or in the case of a native PCI Express drive, the controller is actually inside the drive. So the interface to it is a pure PCI Express interface. There's several different technologies emerging and growing and developing in, in PCI Express storage. And these really take advantage of the increase in speeds of flash memory and next generation of NAND technology. So PCI Express is a solid, scalable, tested platform. PCI Express itself is not new. Gen 3 or PCI Express 3.0 devices have been around uh, for almost four years now. So the, the technology is, is there. It gives a significant bandwidth uh, increase over a uh, serial ATA or a SAS con uh, connection. The principle of all the PCI Express storage is, is the same, but the software and the implementations may be very different. Just like you may have a SCSI-based storage architecture or an ATA-based storage architecture, those are higher levels and don't really care about the, the physical transport. But um, part of the reason PCI Express was successful in the first place was uh, the fact that the software stack was moved over from conventional PCI. Uh, the same could probably be said of storage protocols. Although they're moving to a PCI Express-based physical layer and transport, the software layers are, are largely remaining the same. So the device still looks like a SCSI drive or an ATA drive to, to the software and the operating system. So if I move on now to the, the hardware form factors, there's various different form factors for PCI Express uh, based drives. Uh, the first one is, is the obvious PCI Express uh, standard CEM connector. This is defined in the PCI Express card electromechanical specification of the CEM spec. And it's the typical slot you would see on a PC motherboard. Uh, the example there on the slide is, is one which is uh, a by one slot. But it's also specified as a by 4, by 8, by 16. I think even a by 32 is defined, although I've never actually seen one of those. But, but very common is a by 1, by 4, by 8, by 16. So uh, those are your typical PCI Express card. In the past, uh, your storage controller devices would be on one of those PCI Express form factor cards. Uh, graphics cards also use that. Network cards also use that. There's also embedded PCI Express, which doesn't have any connectors. So it may be just a chip that's on a board. That's uh, definitely more challenging to be able to debug, but, but there are still ways of doing that. So that's your standard PCI Express form factor. One that's emerging uh, and is very popular for PCI Express-based storage is the SFF8639 connector. This is, in a lot of ways, similar to a serial ATA connector except it has extra pins defined on it. So it allows to have uh, PCI Express, SAS, and SATA on the same connector. And this even supports up to uh, 8 gig PCI Express. So you can have a by four, 8 gigs, so four lanes of 8 gig PCI Express on the same connector that you had a, a, a SATA connector. It's a similar form factor of connector, but it's not exactly the same connector. 
So a little closer look there at, at the SFF8639 connector. The nice thing about this is it has PCI Express as the interface to it, but it allows a two and a half inch or a three and a half inch type form factor more in common with what a drive would look like. Um, so the physical drive looks like a, a SATA drive or a SAS drive, uh, but it's a, a, it can be a PCI Express based drive. The connector itself supports single port SATA, dual port SATA Express, dual port SAS, multi-lane SAS, and PCI Express Gen 3 by 4. So all through that same connector. Uh, so if you want to analyze that, instead of using a PCI Express uh, standard interposer, you would use uh, an SFF8639 interposer like the one in the picture here. So typically uh, an 8639 device would be plugged into a backplane. Um, let me see if I can... Uh, point the pointer here. So the pointer uh, is down at the bottom here. This would be an 8639 connector with an SST type device plugged into it. And then you would use a, an analyzer, a protocol analyzer uh, interposer that looks like this. So. Uh, the next type of form factor um, is uh, M.2 form factor. Now this is similar to what may have been seen in a, a laptop as a mini PCI Express connector or even going back to mini PCI connectors. It's a very small form factor. It, flits, it fits uh, parallel to the, the board that it's plugged into. And it's really, uh, it can be used for any, any types of PCI Express device, but uh, the fact that PCI Express storage devices are not necessarily in a, a in a two and a half inch form factor. It doesn't have a spinning drive in it, so it doesn't necessarily have to be in that little box. It's possible to put a, it's possible to put a, a reasonable size of storage device on this tiny uh, M.2 form factor card. So although it's uh, really aimed at laptops or, or tablets, mobile devices, I've also seen these being used in, in server platforms as well. Just the fact that it takes up much less space. Um, it's, it's definitely ideal for things like ultrabooks and tablets and lightweight PCs. So a couple of different formats of the NGFF or M.2 form factor. Um, they're basically differentiated by the key. There's a B key and an M key. So depending on which side the key is at will determine uh, which type of sockets that that, that M.2 device will fit into. And there's different types of sockets defined, there's socket 2 and socket 3. Uh, PCI Express based SSDs are uh, available with B and M keys and they fit in both socket 2 and socket 3s. Um, socket 3 only supporting two PCI Express lanes, where socket 2 would support four PCI Express lanes. There's also different lengths of M.2 card. So while the width is fixed, there's there's different uh, lengths defined in the specification for that. So a larger storage device may have a longer card on it. So moving on to PCI Express storage. I mentioned before that the PCI Express storage is really at the application layer. So that's the, the highest level in the stack. So this is really all embedded inside the PCI Express transaction layer. And so it fits into the layered model, whether it's NVMe, HCI, SATA Express, or PQI, SOP, SCSI Express, it's all inside this, those uh, transaction layer packets. So your analyzer has to be able to decode those. So there it is, it's all embedded. So the storage technologies themselves are typically quite simple at the hardware level and leave a lot of the work to be done by software. So the device driver and the operating system uh, does a lot of the work. So the PCI Express part of it is purely a transport. But often the only interface to this uh, storage that's external that you can plug an analyzer into is the PCI Express connector. So the PCI Express analyzer has to be able to decode those protocols within the PCI Express transaction layer. The other thing is remember that they may not be on a standard PCI Express form factor. So a PCI Express analyzer that you bought 10 years ago wouldn't necessarily have the correct interposer to be able to, to debug a PCI Express storage device. So how does a system know that it's a PCI Express storage device? Well, if we look in the configuration space of a PCI Express device, there's a field called class code. And that class code is defined in the PCI Express class code uh, specification. And that tells the, the, the BIOS what kind of device it is. 
So the case for an NVM Express device, that class code field would show as 010802, 01 being for a mass storage controller, 08 for an NVM device, and then 02 for an NVM Express device. And each type of device has its own class code that can be shown. So a serial AT ATA device may show a 01 still for a mass storage controller, uh, and then 06 uh, for for the ATA based and then depending on which level of HCI it supports the, the last number may change. So if I look at the uh, the class code from an analyzer perspective we can see that the 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 field is being read by the system uh, by the BIOS during the configuration time and then that field is, is identified there in the analyzer trace and the base class in the background shows the uh, the different uh, specifications. So I mentioned already about the uh, down here is the 0108 for the NVM Express and then SSD with different, uh, whether it's a, just a basic solid state storage controller, NVM HCI 1.0 or an NVM Express. Actually the latest version of the, the class code specification uh, lists this as an NVM Express. So. Okay, I'll just... Uh, switch back to normal mode here. Okay, so what is NVMe? I've been talking about this a lot through, through the presentation. So NVMe is a specification that defines the protocol for transferring data to and from the, an SSD, a flash-based storage device. It's a transport that higher level storage protocols can use, which takes advantage of a high performance and a low latency interface. It's really designed as a very lean interface that allows to take advantage of NAND flash. It's designed to be parallel and scalable. So in virtualized systems, for example, it can be very uh, useful. It can be scaled from something simple that can be used in a, in a laptop or a tablet up to something that can be used in a, in a very complex server environment. Uh, but it allows the scalability without losing the benefits of this lean protocol. And like I said, it's adaptable from servers to, to laptops. Some companies driving uh, NVMe uh, can be seen there on the list. I'm sure there's others now. Um, I certainly see a lot of activity in, in NVMe land, uh, especially over the last year. So I, I mainly work on PC Express technology, but a large percentage of the questions I get are related to NVMe devices. So I've included some, some terminology here about NVMe. Um, these are uh, basic things that are, are done in the software. So the submission queue, the completion queue, these are buffers that are, are defined inside the host memory. And these are used for the transfer of data between the host and the drive. And then the, the NVMe uses a concept of doorbell registers. So it basically goes out and tells the device, hey, I've got something ready for you. And then the device will go back and, and read it. And I'll show some examples in a trace file in a moment. And then a port in NVMe terminology is a queue set of a submission queue and a completion queue. So the first thing that happens in, in an NVMe device when it's plugged into a system and the system boots is the device or the, the BIOS goes out and reads the class code like I mentioned a moment ago. Then what it does is it assigns addresses to the base address registers inside the configuration space of the PCI Express device. So it looks at those registers, determines what the, the address uh, requirements are, and then programs an appropriate address for the system. Once it's done with that, it then enables the memory bit in the command register. So you can see on the top example here, the, uh, the base address register that it's written to is R0 and the address is given as F7E0000. And that's going to be important when we look at the next slide because that is the memory address that this SSD is going to be responding to from the system. For it to be able to do anything, the memory enable bit has to be set in the command register and that's something that the BIOS does with the configuration right. And that's the lowest bit in here. Actually, bit, uh, bits 0, 1 and 2 are the the master enable, memory enable, and I.O. space enable. In this case, the, the I.O. space is not enabled. And then the other thing is done is NVMe uses MSIX or MSI messaging interrupts. 
to be able to for the card to tell the system that it's finished. Uh, and we'll see this in the trace in a moment. But this is basically a memory write, but the, the MSI X capability has to be enabled on the device for the memory write to, to be able to mean anything. So that's done in the configuration space. So when I go to the NVMe controller registers, this is kind of like a configuration space at a, at a higher level than the PCI Express one. So where I had configuration register 10 here was the, let me just do a pointer. So that address, that bar address is configuration space 10 F7E0. When I go to the next page, this offset of 0 here is going to be, in that case, F7E0000. This is going to be F7E0008 and so on. So the completion queue head doorbell is going to be F7E01000. So these are memory addresses that are on the SSD. So when a, a system goes out to try and configure the NVMe space, which is going to be either the, the firmware on the system, the EFI, or, or the device driver or the operating system, it's going to be doing memory reads and writes to these addresses on the controller. And I'll show you what it looks like from an analyzer trace, what the system actually does uh, with each of these registers. So here's a, a, a capture of the initialization of an NVMe uh, drive in a, in a system. So the first thing that goes out is the the BIOS goes and reads the capabilities from the the drive. So each of these is going to be a memory read from those addresses, those particular offsets on the drive. I'll show you in a moment what the PCI Express underlying uh, uh, transactions are. It, it reads the capabilities. This is the controller configuration here. The enable bit is not set to zero at this point, but down here, eventually, once it's it's programmed the submission queue and completion queue base addresses, eventually, it enables the controller, and then the controller status is read back as ready. It may not show ready immediately, but the, that may be polled until until the the register is shown as ready. So if I break that out, what do the underlying PCI Express transactions look like? So when it reads the capability register, this is a memory read coming from the host to address F7E0000. And then there's a read, a memory read from F7E0004. So if I go back here, we can see that that's reading the controller capabilities uh, register. And the analyzer here decodes those into what the actual fields are. So this data payload, uh, hang on, let me go here. This, point, this, this data payload here is decoded into the capabilities up here. Then the version is read, we can see from the, uh, the, uh, the list on the here, the version is offset 8. We can see that it reads it here, but it decodes it as the version. So the key thing here is the protocol analyzer for PCI Express is actually decoding the NVMe transactions. And you'll see it walks through each of the registers and reads those in sequence and then decodes it. So the next thing that is done is once it's read the capabilities, it starts to write some addresses. So you can see what happens is uh, it starts sending memory writes from the host to F7E00024, 3034282C, and so on. You can see that the analyzer decodes that that's what it's actually writing, is those, uh, those address ranges. Then this is a controller configuration. Uh, it's enabled down here by a memory write, and then when it reads back the status, this is a read from the host to the device, which comes back with the status being ready. And I basically have some comments there. So once it's done this initialization and the controller is actually ready, then the controller is ready to do a command. 
And the command happens by the host, first of all, setting the doorbell register on the device, which tells the device, go to the memory, to the, the address I told you earlier, and there's a command there for you. So the device reads the command. In this case, it's the identify command from the host. And then the host knows, OK, this is the identify command, so I'm going to provide this identify data. It was told that the identify command in this case was the identify the controller data structure. I can see that here from this field. So then when the device comes back here, it comes back with the identify controller. In this case, it was an, a LaCroix NVMe device. Now, the, the traffic that's generated here, this command, this is all done by the device driver in the system. You can see this is a 256D word structure of data that's all been decoded here. And then at the end of it, there's a completion. This is saying that the command has been completed, and this came from the device. So this particular one is a, is a complete uh, sequence for, for an identify controller data structure. The next thing that happens is an identify command again, but in this case, it's actually the namespace identify rather than the, the controller data structure. So then the device comes back and it responds with the identify namespace data. So these are still uh, initialization commands, but these are the first things that happen when the system boots. If I look at uh, an actual I.O. command, in this case is a read, then the read command contains information about where the data is. Now you have to think about this if you're going to do a read to a drive. So say, for example, you're going to save information from a text file onto the hard drive. What direction does the data flow go? Well, what will happen is the host will tell the drive, I've got some data for you. The drive will read the command from the host that will tell it what to do with the data. If it's a read command, the data is going to reside in the host. So the drive would actually go out and read the data from the host. The data is going to be provided, and then that would be written to the flash memory. So although you're actually writing to the drive, the data would be in the form of a memory read, a PCI Express memory read. If you have the inverse of that, if you were to read from a drive uh, to the system, that would actually be the same pr same principle. The, the host would say, I want to read some data from the drive. Then the drive would read that command from the host, say, OK, this is a, a read command at the NVMe level. And then it would actually write the data from the drive to the, the area of host memory in the I.O. completion queue. And those areas of, of memory are defined as PRPs. It's really pointers to areas in memory where it's going to write that data. Okay. So how do I debug these products? It may take a different way of thinking how you use a PCI Express analyzer for debugging storage problems. The protocols reside within the PCI Express payload data. You have to be able to decode that to find out what's going on. So you have to be able to trigger on that data as well. It's possible the only interface to these devices is actually a PCI Express interface. There's no physical way you can connect to it to see what's going on. So you really do have to use a PCI Express analyzer. And the different form factors means you have to think also differently about using a PCI Express analyzer. So this is just another example of, of NVMe here, the, the way that the submission queues are being set up. This is a PCI Express capture but only shown NVMe commands. I don't see any PCI Express commands here. But underlying those commands is always a PCI Express uh, packet. Really what we're seeing here, if, if we take a look at this level, this is the application level. This doesn't show anything at the PCI Express transaction data link or physical layer. That assumes all those levels are, are taken care of. And it goes back to what I mentioned earlier is if there's a problem at the physical layer, you may see errors at this level and you've got to determine is it really a physical layer error or is it a, 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 an error in software at the higher level. Here's an example of a serial ATA trace. And you think, OK, it's a serial ATA trace. This is actually a PCI Express trace, but it's decoded as a serial ATA trace. So we see ATA commands there, but underlying each of those commands is actually a PCI Express transaction. 
So this is not using a serial ATA analyzer, it's using a PCI Express analyzer, but decoding the payload as serial ATA. In this case, it, it was an HCI-based uh, serial ATA card. And this, this case was actually not a, a, serial, uh, a PCI Express-based drive. It was a serial ATA drive with an HCI controller card and the analyzer between the PCI Express slot and the controller card. But you can see it fully decodes the, the, the payload into the ATA command. So that's even two levels up from the PCI Express transaction layer. So what tools would you use for PCI Express-based SSD technologies? So for PCI Express, uh, you've got the Summit T316, T38, T28. The 3 and the 2 there refers to basically Gen 3 or Gen 2, uh, meaning 8 gig capable, 16 lanes, 8 gig capable, 8 lanes, or 5 gig capable, 8 lanes. For host and device emulation, which you can use for compliance testing, you would use some form of exerciser, and the Summit Z316 is, a, is an excellent choice for that. There's a PCI Express MPHI uh, or an MPCIe analyzer we also have. In theory, you could have an NVMe device that had a PCI Express over MPHI physical layer. Uh, and the Eclipse X34 is, is a, an analyzer. It uses the same software package for, for PCI Express, but it actually has the MPHI physical layer hardware. And then for NVMe, SCSI Express and SATA Express, the same analyzers can do the decoding. It's really just a software decode, and that's all included in the standard software package. It's a picture of what these tools look like. Uh, in the back, we have the Summit T316. The T38 is the by 8 version of that. I see a lot of uh, storage-based devices are by 4. I don't see too many that are by 8 or by 16. Um, we also have the Summit T28, which is a lower cost option if, if you're only doing a Gen 2 or 5 gig only PCI Express. And then the test platform with the exerciser. Just a, a close up of each of the individual analyzers there. So we have a Summit T24 as well, which is, is for up to 5 gig and it's a by 4 only analyzer. But any of these analyzers could be used for, for doing NVMe decode. The exerciser card can be used for host emulation or it can be used for device emulation. So the traces that I took earlier were actually using this exerciser card as a NVMe drive emulator. So as far as the operating system and the, the, the motherboard is concerned, it actually looks just like a real drive. And the driver that was used was the Windows 8.1 standard NVMe driver. There's no special driver to make it work with the NVMe card, so it's the nat native driver in Windows 8.1. If you're using it as a device emulator, you would plug the S exerciser card into the slot on the PC. If you're using it as a host emulator, which you may do for doing compliance testing, uh, you would plug it into the test platform on the right there. So you plug the exerciser into one slot and then the device under test into the other slot. We also have adapters that go from uh, PCI Express Edge connector to an uh, 8639 uh, connector if you wanted to use the, the exerciser with, with an 8639 based drive. In terms of interposers, um, if you're using a standard PCI Express based form factor, you would use a standard PCI Express slot interposer. Uh, this is one version of it here that supports up to 8 gig PCI Express. Uh, also supports the clock request line, so we get a lot of requests for uh, how to debug L1 substates. So all our new interposers support uh, the monitoring of the clock request line and also support L1 substate support. We also support SRIS, so the separate reference, uh, reference clock with independent SSC. Uh, that's basically allowing two clock inputs to the analyzer. Those are all supported on the new interposers. The, the particular interposer here is a by 16 version, but we have it also in by 8, by 4, and by 1. For SFF8639 form factor, this is what the interposer looks like. And this will work for NVMe, SCSI Express, or SATA Express as well. There's different connectors on it. We have two versions of it too. There's a dual port and a single port. So the, the single port will support by 4 PCI Express. The dual port will support two ports of by 2 PCI Express. And then uh, the last interposer we have is the, the M.2 interposer. Um, this is what you would use. You would plug the on the left side here. This would plug into your, your slot. And then the device would plug in to the other end of the interposer here. And we have these for B and M uh, models of M.2 slot. So those are available and shipping right now. 
We actually have more interposers than that, uh, various different form factors. We have much more information on that on our website. That's uh, pretty much all I had to say here. I've left a few minutes at the end here uh, for any questions. Uh, if they come up, we'll review those in just a second. Uh, there's a lot more information you can find on our website, www.teledynelacroix.com. Uh, PSG support at teledynelacroix.com. LaCroix.com is our uh, email address that I'm copied on that email. So if you have any questions after the after the fact and you want to ask them privately, uh, please feel free to send us an email if you have any any questions. You can download the software from our website. Uh, the analyzer software is there. There's sample files included in that. The Telescan PE software, uh, which is used for scanning and config space, is a free tool that's also available on our website. And also on our website, you'll find some some application notes. So just uh, some conclusions here. So the easiest way to debug PCI Express problems is to de determine which layer is showing the problem. Always go back to that layered model. Using the correct tool will make the job a lot easier. So don't try and use an oscilloscope if you're trying to debug an NVMe issue, unless it's really a physical layer problem. Storage technologies that are based on PCI Express require a different approach, may require you to use a PCI Express analyzer where you would have used a SATA analyzer in the past, for example. Uh, and like I mentioned before, make sure the electrical part is working. The compliance uh, program that the PCI SIG has, even if you don't go to a compliance workshop, it gives a pretty good, uh, at least a sanity check on defined testing for each of the layers of PCI Express. Uh, that can give you a good idea if a device is going to work. And that's that's really the whole goal of the PCI SIG is to promote interoperability. So if you pass that level of tests, it's not an exhaustive validation of a device, but at least going to give you a, a good idea if the device is going to work. And then these PCI Express storage technologies are evolving. I mean, over the last six months to a year, I've seen drastic changes, a lot more devices around. And I think that the technologies will subtly change as the spec revisions go on in the future.